Good evening. My name is Michael Selbst and I'm the President of Board of Directors of Hamilton Hall. Welcome and thank you for joining us as we celebrate together while remaining safely apart. In this surreal year of anxiety and cancellations, we're blessed to be able to take a moment to reflect on all that we have, the people, the places, and the traditions that matter to us. Speaking on behalf of the Hall, we are deeply grateful for your support. I invite you to grab something to eat and something to drink and sit down and relax and enjoy this brief video highlighting the 2020 Holiday Dance Patronesses and some of the traditions that have brought Holiday Dance Revelers to this very building for over 215 years. Designed by Samuel McIntyre and built in 1805 as an elegant assembly hall with three floors and a grand ballroom, Hamilton Hall has hosted future presidents and countless public figures and to this day provides an exquisite setting for social events and community gatherings. Of these is an annual Christmas party that began in the early 1800s and over generations has evolved along with the social customs of the times, bringing us to the present day holiday dance a unique event with well-preserved traditions from a bygone era. Come along as we explore this event and its traditions. As guests climb the staircase to the second floor and grand ballroom, they're first greeted by a team of tuxedoed ushers. The tradition of ushers at a black tie ball dates from the early 1800s and has been part of the holiday dance as long as anyone can remember. Wearing red or gold sashes to indicate their status, ushers escort guests into the ballroom to be presented to the patronesses and patrons. According to head usher Peter Mason, their tasks for the evening include ensuring that the guests enjoy themselves. The usher presents the couple to the patronesses with the man on the usher's left arm and the woman on the usher's right. After a brief bow and or curtsy, the usher will immediately escort the couple away from the patronesses and onto the dance floor. For some perspective on this tradition, here's former head usher Trip Mason, Peter Mason's father. The committee's asked me to make this short video um, as a way to participate in this year's virtual dance, uh, which I'm very happy to do, by the way. Uh, I received this beautiful invitation, uh, which I think is absolutely fantastic. I'm glad that this is all happening. Uh, and also, I want you to know that I dressed for this occasion in Maine. It's customary to wear our best flannel shirts for important events. Uh, so I want you to know that I am dressed appropriately. Uh, I became an usher when I got out of the service in um, 1973, 1974. Uh, worked under the tutelage of the then head usher, my father, uh, for a few years. And then when my father retired to Maine, uh, I took over as head usher, and I believe about 1980, uh, 1979. I was head usher until 2017, along with uh, Peter Mary and Tim Lutz. Very much enjoyed my duties as head usher, although some years were more strenuous than others. Um, but it was a terrific way to participate in and be a part of a wonderful Salem tradition. Uh, which extends back many years uh, prior to us and hopefully will continue for many years beyond us. Uh, I remember quite clearly having discussions with Bill Burns, who I think a lot of you will remember, uh, about the origin of the dance. Um, and I quite clearly remember Bill telling me that he went to the dance in the 1930s, I believe it was his first dance. Uh, so we could have it at least dated from there. Uh, Bill's recollection was that the dance uh, had started many years before that. So that's the extent of my knowledge uh, regarding the historic aspects of the dance. Uh, as head usher, we had uh, many responsibilities, chief among them uh, is basically to be there on an emergency sort of basis if anything were to happen in the building to get people out safely. So that was always a concern. The other concern was uh, on occasion, rare occasion, a guest may have had too much to drink uh, and could possibly act belligerently or some other um, uh, some other behavior that we found uh, unacceptable for such an occasion. Uh, and uh, three or four of us would gather together and escort usually the gentleman out of the building. 
uh, other experiences. Uh, I have some very funny ones that I recall fondly that uh, I will not share with you, uh, mostly because uh, because discretion is the better part of the job of being an usher. Uh, so I will continue with that tradition. Uh, once again, uh, thank you very much for including me this year. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, my son is now the head usher, so you have a complete three-generational picture. My dad, myself, and not my son, uh, Peter. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all in the future. Um, please have a terrific time this year and have fun. Be safe, COVID free. Bye. The role of patronesses at balls and social events in the United States most likely began in the 1800s and stems from British court traditions. Patronesses and patrons are considered the hosts of the event and formally greet the guests upon arrival. When the guests are presented to the patronesses and patrons, the men and sometimes women bow and the women curtsy. The patronesses and patrons in reply bow or curtsy back and about that curtsy. The word itself derives from courtesy, meaning politeness, and is an act of showing respect. Originating in England in the 1500s, the curtsy was designed as an easier alternative to dropping to your knees, a practice that was necessary every time you met a royal. It used to require instruction and practicing. Nowadays, the curtsy is more loosely interpreted. This gesture of greeting with courtesy and respect has endured as a holiday dance tradition. This year, we've chosen to honor eight extraordinary women who are relatively unknown today, but significant in Salem's history. Nancy Lennox was born into a prosperous, free black family in Newton, Massachusetts. She was married to Caribbean emigre, John Remond in 1807, and the couple moved to Salem, where they took up residence in the newly built Hamilton Hall as its resident caterers and managers. They had 10 children, all while building a number of businesses in Salem. Nancy offered lunches and dinners in downtown Salem at an establishment called The Sign of the Lantern. The couple also operated a hair salon, an oyster bar, and an ice cream parlor but their entrepreneurial spirit wasn't all that drove them. Nancy and her husband John were members of anti-slavery societies and were active in abolitionist circles. Two of their children became anti-slavery orators. In 1835, the Remens made the difficult decision to leave Salem and their many businesses behind when their younger daughters were denied entrance to Salem High School. They returned only when Salem schools were finally desegregated. The Remond story is indeed a great African-American, American, and Salem story. Elizabeth Elkins Sanders of 39 Chestnut Street was a fierce critic of American cultural imperialism and an equally fierce advocate for Native Americans. Her views were way ahead of her time. She published The Aborigines of North America in 1828 and The First Settlers of New England in 1829, as well as several other literary essays and reviews. The intense presidential campaign of 1828, pitting notorious Indian fighter Andrew Jackson against Massachusetts native son John Quincy Adams, inspired her to write a tract on missions. It was published when she was 82 years old. She was indeed a remarkable woman, as well as committee member Martha Sanders' great-great-great-grandmother. Clarissa Lawrence was an African-American school teacher who lived on High Street in a house that still stands unmarked. In 1832, she established the first female anti-slavery society of Salem, which consisted solely of free women of color. This organization was folded into the larger Salem Female Anti-Slavery Society in 1834 and elected Lawrence as its vice president. The society provided aid and relief to those who had escaped from the South while aiding the cause of abolition across the nation. Clarissa Lawrence was sent by the society as a delegate to the third anti-slavery convention of American women in Philadelphia in May of 1839, where she gave a fiery speech on the last day of the assembly. We meet the monster prejudice everywhere, was renowned among her peers and historians, and has been frequently reprinted and referenced. Yet, Clarissa Lawrence is largely forgotten in her hometown of Salem. Mary Herod Northend came from old Massachusetts families. 
Her father, William Dummer Northend, was a prominent attorney and a state senator for Salem. Mary was born at 17 Beckford Street in a side-to-street late federal house. The family moved to Lind Street in the late 1850s. By all accounts, Mary led a quiet life until her 50s when she began to write about colonial Salem and New England. Like other colonial revivalists of her generation, she was fearful that appreciation for colonial era architecture and decorative arts was fading. Eleven books were published between 1904 and 1926, and she wrote many articles for magazines such as Good Housekeeping and House Beautiful. A fierce advocate for traditional New England material culture, Mary became an expert on New England architecture and antiquities, and a great advocate for all things Old Salem. Sarah Simons was a ninth-generation Salem resident. Sarah graduated from Emerson College in Boston and began a career as a bas-relief artist in the 1890s. In 1904, her Hawthorne pieces received several mentions in press coverage for the centennial commemoration of his birth. This exposure may have launched her career. She began making and selling pieces at the John Ward House, the Hawthorne Hotel gift shop, and a little place called the Snug Harbor Shop by the House of Seven Gables. Sarah established a colonial studio in the Bray House on Brown Street, recently restored by the Peabody Essex Museum. Early in the 20th century, Sarah was one of the first Salem artists to introduce the figure of the witch in her work. Her contemporaries shied away from the subject of Salem's darkest episode, but Sarah embraced it. She made round witches, tall witches, witches on brooms, witches with cauldrons, witch plaques, statuettes, medallions, and inkwells. Sarah Simon's craftsmanship ensured the work was highly prized and collected both in her time and today. Louise DuPont Crown and Shield was not a Salem native or resident. However, her preservation efforts left an indelible mark on the city through her involvement in the Salem Maritime National Historic Site and the Peabody Essex Museum. The heiress to the DuPont industrial fortune, she was raised at Wintrature and married to Francis Boardman Crown and Shield, a Boston Brahmin with Salem roots. Louise was an avid collector of early American material culture. This passion brought her into the early preservationist movement. After restoring her family's original homestead, she worked her way up the East Coast, participating in a succession of preservation initiatives from Virginia to Massachusetts, including Independence Hall in Philadelphia, the Pierce Nichols House, and the Gardner Pingree House. Her interest and investment in the Derby House was integral to the establishment of the Salem Maritime National Historical Site, the first of its kind in the National Park Service. Louise was also one of the founders of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. She was committed to her belief that Americans are, quote, better for having around them some visible remains of the past. Marjorie Bedinger was born in Salem in 1891. This daughter of the St. Peter's Church rector and granddaughter of the ambassador to Denmark committed herself to the suffrage movement at a critical time and went on to lead a very interesting and independent life. In 1914 and 15, she was one of many members of the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association, campaigning actively for women's right to vote. They capped off the campaign in Boston with an impressive parade of supporters 9,000 strong, including Helen Keller. Despite their efforts, Massachusetts women did not get the right to vote until the 19th Amendment was ratified five years later. Marjorie was no doubt disappointed by the returns of 1915, but she moved steadfastly forward. She completed her graduate degree in library science and became the first female librarian at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. She later assumed a succession of academic library directorships, authored an authoritative book on Native American jewelry, and traveled the world, finally retiring to Hawaii. A native of Vermont, Dr. Sarah E. Sherman moved to Salem following her graduation from the Boston University School of Medicine in 1876. She was the first woman to establish a professional medical practice in Salem, which she ran successfully until her death in 1900. She was active in both her profession and in the city of Salem, serving as the first president of the Salem Women's Club, as well as that of the Massachusetts Surgical and Gynecological Society. She was also a lecturer at Emerson College and a trustee of both that college and Boston University. Following the 1879 passage of a Massachusetts law enabling women to run and vote in school committee elections, Dr. Sherman was one of four women elected to the Salem School Committee, the largest number in the state. She was a tireless supporter of women's suffrage, public health reform, and the Salem Public Schools, especially the kindergarten program. Hello, 
and good evening. My name is Petra Slinkard, and I am the Director of Curatorial Affairs and the Nancy B. Putnam Curator of Fashion and Textiles at the Peabody Essex Museum, and it is an absolute pleasure to spend this evening with you. I am here this evening to take you through a walk of fashions of yore that coincide with 200 years of the Hamilton Hall Ball. So, without further ado, dressing for the ball, a look through the wardrobe. The hall was established in 1805, and what you see on your screen currently is an example of the kinds of fashions that would have been worn in celebration at this time. The waistline is an impure waistline rising beyond the natural waist to just under the bosom. The train is relatively long. The skirt is sheer, and the sheer the better. Uh, there was definitely a, a sense of wanting to showcase the body in this particular type of clothing. Um, but as we move forward to 1827, we already start to see a shift in the evolution of this particular style. There's more ornamentation on the ensemble, the train shrinks and the waistline does start to fall a little bit lower, not quite natural waist, uh, but almost. This is an example of a six piece coral set brought to the United States from Europe by Captain Nathan Endicott and was donated to the museum in 1916. Um, this is a, an example of a poirier who, which would have been worn by a woman at an occasion, perhaps such as the Hamilton Hall Ball. And we can't, of course, leave out the gentleman. So moving forward to 1840, we have examples of gentlemen's clothing. And if you look very closely at the silhouette of the gentleman, you see that their waistlines are also tightly nipped in and that the flare um, at the hips does mimic the silhouette of their female companions. Um, this is an example from the Peabody Essex Museum's collection, a man's top hat with travel case, which was procured from Webb the Hatter at 217. Essex Street Salem and one of the advertisements that I found for this business used the tagline where all the well-dressed gentlemen in Salem go. And then moving forward to the late 1830s into the 1840s, we have a beautiful uh, dress on the screen that was embroidered by Susan Green of Boston, Massachusetts, who was a friend of Sophia Peabody Hawthorne and her sisters. And there's some really beautiful details here to this garment. Here's an example of a pair of shoes from 1839 that would have been worn. Um, and these shoes were made by Edward Swain Davis, uh, who worked in Lynn, Massachusetts, which of course was a, a shoe hub for not only New England, but, but the entire United States um, in the 19th century. And as we move forward, we have another example of a fashionable lady from the 1840s and a gentleman from the 1930s who is dressing as if he was in the 1840s. And so we already start to see in the 20th, early 20th century a fascination with fashions of the past and people digging back to find uh, moments of play through their clothing. And as we move forward to the 1870s, we have this gorgeous gown on the right-hand side, which is currently on view in Pem's Fashion and Design Gallery, which is an example of a wedding dress. But of course, you'll notice right away that it is not white, which was not atypical of this time period because fabric uh, was so expensive and so was clothing. It was sort of an astute decision on behalf of the wearer to pick a color that was most complementary to her so she could continue to wear a dress of this expense over and over again. Here are examples of shoes from 1876 that would have been worn with an example that we just saw from the M. Hart Corporation, again based in Beverly and donated a major gift to the museum in the 1970s. This is an example of a dress from 1891 made in Boston and the fashion plates on the right hand side uh, exemplify the look of the turn of the 20th century. So the waist is more nipped in. We're starting to see that classic S silhouette that would be associated with um, individuals such as the Gibson girl. Um, and we're starting to see that um, women's fashions are taking on um, a, a very lively uh, and a little bit less constricted uh, silhouette than previously. This is a gorgeous ensemble um, made in the 19 teens in China um, using Chinese fabric, but of course cut in a, in a more traditional Western style. And I'll have you note um, the credit line here, which is gift, gift of Chestnut Street Associates. 
This is a fashion plate from the 1920s, uh, moving us now and firmly rooting us in a, in a very hallmark uh, year for women's liberation, and that is 1920, where the ratification of the 19th Amendment um, took hold. And now, of course, 100 years later, we are marking that anniversary with a look back at women's suffrage. These are two um, dresses from the mid-1920s. You can see that this is really the moment where the hemline has risen to its highest point, um, and it creates room for movement and, of course, and most importantly, dancing. And here's another example from 1927. So you can really see that the range of fabrics runs a range of colors and a different kinds of qualities and techniques. And this luminescent quality to this particular fabric would have looked absolutely beautiful under candlelight. And as we move into the 1930s, the, sh the silhouette, of course, shifts again. Um, designers are starting to utilize the bias cut with more regularity, and the silhouette and women, and of course, the decade, takes on a more sort of somber and mature um, look as we continue into the 1940s. And it is no surprise, I'm sure, to anyone here that, of course, the two world wars significantly impacted what went on in fashion in the 20th century. And so as we move forward, we start to see more of a rigid and structured silhouette evolve from this very soft, sinuous silhouette of the 1930s. Um, here's an example from a fashion show in Oyster Harbors from Cape Cod Community College in 1939. And then of course when we get into the 1950s, we um, begin with this very classic strapless um, hourglass silhouette that was so prominent um, and so ubiquitous in 1950s fashion. Um, and then of of course, you could never wear an ensemble such as that without incorporating um, the now and then highly popular stiletto shoe. This ensemble here, which is a leopard coat worn in 1963, and the donor purchased this coat um, just a few years before the United States government put much stricter restrictions on importing exotic animals for wear into the United States. Uh, and so the donor did retire this coat and then eventually give it to the museum. Um, but in her own words, she said, I wanted to imitate Jackie Kennedy, Liz Taylor, and Bridget Bardot, the style icons of the 1960s. These are two dinner jackets from the 1970s that were on view at Mr. Sid in Newton Center, Massachusetts. Um, and of course, as the 1970s progresses, um, we see a much looser, freer um, silhouette and construction of garments for both men and women. And then as we move into the 1980s, we see that return to that hourglass silhouette and the strapless bodice. Um, this is a beautiful ensemble um, from the Canadian designer Arnold Scazzi, who studied with Charles James, if you're familiar with his work, and um, was a great favorite of individuals such as Nancy Reagan and Barbara Streisand. And then as we move into the 1990s, I have two examples of tuxedos on the screen. One worn um, in a traditional sense by a man, and the second on the right-hand side um, is a version of the tuxedo, a jumpsuit uh, worn by um, Iris Apfel, and the tuxedo on the left-hand side was worn by her husband, Carl. And this marks an interesting moment in our fashion history where there becomes um, a little bit more uh, mainstream uh, acceptance of um, a genderless fashion and sort of playing with these blurred lines as to what is um, feminine wear and what is masculine wear. And then as we move forward again into the 2000s, um, we have examples of designer wear, such as Balenciaga with the cocktail dress on the left-hand side, or this beautiful frothy uh, Chanel on the right-hand side, um, which almost mimics a, a corset. So again, kind of playing with this notion of um, outer uh, underwear as outerwear. And then finally ending with this gorgeous piece um, by Carolina Herrera in 2016. And so, you know, as we look at the evolution of these fashions, we see, you know, quite a, a bit of similarity, but also a lot of distinction uh, over the time. And finally, we end in 2020, where sadly we can't be together in this moment, but we look at um, the beautiful ensembles that are on loan to the hall in an effort 
start to enliven the space with the spirit of coming together and celebrating the closing of this year and the holidays. And on behalf of myself and everyone at the Peabody Essex Museum, we wish you a happy holiday. Thank you. The Supper Room, the site of many elaborate feasts, including those once prepared by the hall's caterers, John and Nancy Remond. Traditionally, banquet-style suppers were an important part of the hall's events, and this tradition continues at the holiday dance as guests take a break from dancing to head to the supper room for sandwiches and a wide array of desserts. The supper room also leads to the balcony, a great spot for photos with its wide view of the merry activity in the ballroom below. One of the more popular items at the dance is the bourbon punch. Perhaps a few of you watching have recreated your own version and are enjoying it right now. According to Simon Divert, who writes about English spirits, punch was invented out of a need as an alternative to beer by 17th century sailors working for the British East India Company. When ships reached warmer waters of the Indian Ocean, their beer rations were rancid and flat. Once on shore, the sailors created new drinks out of ingredients indigenous to their destinations rum, citrus, and spices. The sailors brought this beverage back to Britain and soon the drink became a party staple, spreading as far as the American colonies. At the time Hamilton Hall was built, Salem's hugely profitable trade with the Orient had made it one of the wealthiest cities per capita in the U.S. and its seaport one of the busiest. It is likely that Salem developed a taste for punch around that time. Close to midnight, the band will suddenly start playing a rhythmic snare drum roll, and that means it's time for the Grand March. The patronesses and patrons resume their posts, the guests start pouring into the ballroom from all parts of the hall, and the ushers will line up to direct over 300 people, some of whom have had a few glasses of bourbon punch and don't know what's about to happen. Guests are first divided into pairs at the entrance to the ballroom, then arranged in rows, four across, and sent off to march toward the patronesses, at which point they turn either left or right at the direction of an usher, circle the ballroom, then meet again at the other end. What could possibly go wrong? The result is organized chaos, sometimes hilarious and always a lot of fun. The tradition of grand marches at social events has existed in the U.S. since the early 1800s and continues at special gatherings all over the world Sometimes community leaders, public figures, or members of the British royal family are given the honor of leading the first column of marchers. According to V. Persis Dewey, author of Tips for Dancers, published in 1918, in the march, the man should present his right arm to the lady. She rests her fingertips in the crook of his arm. Couples should march in step and in time to the music. They should step on the left on the accented beat of the music. The man should gauge the length of his step by that of his partner. The march music is chosen for the noticeable drum beat and usually is more specifically meant for marches such as military songs. There are various patterns to grand marches that are chosen depending on the size of the group and their familiarity with the march. It's generally advised that the leaders of the first column of marchers have an understanding of the intended pattern. We look forward to seeing who among you rushes to the front of the line next year. our wonderful staff, and the Holiday Dance Committee. Hope you enjoyed this peek into the past, celebrating eight special women and many of the holiday dance traditions. The hall holds a unique place in our shared history, a place born of spirited debate and designed for celebration. It continues to serve both in a variety of ways. Through the lecture series on world affairs, now in its 75th year, the annual Americana lecture, and other lectures and musical events, the hall continues to play an informative role. An active member of the Salem community, Hamilton Hall offers educational opportunities related to the city's history, its inhabitants, and their influence. While our in-person events have not been possible this year, the hall has not been idle. We have opened our doors to provide a remote learning site for a local nonprofit whose goal it is to help first-generation students achieve academic success. Although I wish we were here in this beautiful building in this lovely 1805 ballroom, it has been a privilege to come into your home this evening and share a small slice 
of what makes this annual tradition so special for so many people. Thank you once again for your support of this important historic site that for one night each year brings the past and the present together in a magical night of celebration, dancing, and joy. We hope to see you next year in person. Cheers. Fly with me, we'll float down to Peru. In Lama Land, there's a one-man band, and he'll toot his flute for you. Come fly with me, we'll take off in the blue. Once I get you up there, where the air is rarefied, we're gonna glide, starry-eyed. And when I get you up there, I'll be holding you so near. You may hear all the angels cheer. Cause we're together with wise, it's such a lovely day. Come on and say those words, and we'll beat those birds down to Acapulco Bay. Well, it's perfect for a flying honeymoon, they say. Come on, fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away. I get you up there where the air is rarefied. You and I are gonna glide absolutely starry eyed. When I get you up there, I'll be holding you so near that you may hear all the angels cheer. Cause we're together. When the wise, it is such a lovely day. Just say the words, we'll beat the birds down to Acapulco Bay. Well, it's perfect for a flying honeymoon, they say. Come on, fly with me, let's fly. Come on, fly with me, let's fly. Fly!